Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Anderson House in Washington, D.C. My name is Andy Morse, and I'm the executive director of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation for the achievements of American independence. The Continental Army officers and their French counterparts who founded the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783 believe that America's fight for the cause of freedom and liberty was so important that its memory should always be perpetuated. In addition to this lecture, our institute perpetuates that objective through a variety of educational initiatives. These include supporting advanced study about the American Revolution. Much of that work is done right here in this very building through our esteemed research library. In fact, 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of our library's founding. And with more than 50,000 items in our care, this is without question one of the world's leading special collections on the American Revolution. But there's much more. We develop exhibitions and other historic programs and tours. We advocate for historic preservation, and we provide resources to classrooms nationwide that benefit teachers, students, and scholars alike. Just one example is the American Revolution Institute's YouTube channel. During 2022, it was visited by almost a quarter of a million viewers who watched more than 70,000 hours of our video programs such as this. Since 1938, the Society of Cincinnati has driven this important work from this very building, our headquarters, Anderson House, which is a stunning historic national landmark that was completed in 1905 to be the winter residence of Lars and Isabel Anderson. Tonight's lecture is titled, In League with Liberty, The Persistence of Patriots of Color and Formation of the First Rhode Island Regiment of the Continental Army. The presentation of this important story is made possible in part by a generous grant provided by the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati. Now, before we formally introduce our speaker, let me just take a, one more moment to do a couple quick, quick housekeeping items for the benefit of those who turned in with us tonight virtually. Following this evening's lecture, there will be a question and answer session. So feel free to submit your questions to our speaker at any point during the lecture through the Q&A function that's on the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to incorporate your questions along with the inquiries that come from those in our live audience here tonight. Similarly, should any of you have technical problems or questions, please submit those through the chat function. One of our staff members will be monitoring both the Q&A and the chat functions, and we'll do our very best to assist you. Now, for our featured speaker, it's going to be my pleasure to turn this over to our President General. Everyone in this room knows that George Washington served the Society of Cincinnati figuratively and literally. He was our founding inspiration for the officers of the Continental Army and forces who saw General Washington as the very embodiment of a modern Cincinnatus, one who served selflessly and not was never tethered to power. General Washington was also our first president general, the equivalent of a board chairman. With great respect, we retain that historic title to this day. Therefore, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the gentleman who serves as our 40th president general of the Society of Cincinnati from Baltimore, Maryland, Mr. Frank Turner. Hold your applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before I get started, I did want to thank Andrew Alton, our Director of Historic Programs, and Paul Newman, Museums and Collections Operation Manager, who are both in charge tonight in making sure this program runs smoothly. So Andrew and Paul back there, thank you so much for being here and being part of this event. Thank you all also for being here tonight. The story of the Battle of Rhode Island and the history of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment is a great story, and we're delighted to bring this lecture to you tonight. Early in our revolution, during the late 1777, many of the new American states struggle to fill their enlistment quotas. Rhode Island general named James Varnum had a new idea. He proposed to the Rhode Island General Assembly that they consider a motion to allow the enlistment of different kinds of recruits, drawing from the population of indentured servants and indigenous peoples, as well as former enslaved persons enlisting to earn their freedom. The resolution passed the General Assembly on February 14th, 1778, and thanks to that, the 1st Rhode Island Regiment was formed. It was known as the 1st Black Regiment. The regiment's creation, persistence, and heroism left a legacy that should not be forgotten. In addition to the Battle of Rhode Island, 
This regiment went on to fight in several other important battles during the war. The Society of the Cincinnati very much appreciates the story, along with the sacrifices these men made. A uh, number of our members had decided to invest to support the story. The Society of the Cincinnati Rhode Island made a $15,000 grant to the Battle of Rhode Island Association to be used to prepare a master plan for the restoration of Butts Hill Fort, which is in the north end of the island that Newport, Rhode Island currently sits on. This was an important site used by the British, French, and American forces at different times during the revolution. Our Massachusetts Society has also donated $11,000 to assist in the Battle of the Rhode Island Association in building a new website. Tonight, to commemorate the 245th anniversary of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment's formation, we are pleased to give you one of the true, true scholars on this topic. Robert Geek is a public historian who has been writing on Rhode Island and New England history for more than 30 years. He's the author of 14 books, including the 1st Rhode Island Regiment in the American Revolution from Slaves to Soldier. It's a great read and I highly recommend it. Mr. Geek currently serves as the president of the Co-Kamizic Association, a nonprofit organization that maintains the Smith Castle, the historic house museum in North Kingston, Rhode Island. He also serves on the advisory board of the Rhode Island Slave History Medallion Project. Next week, Mr. Geek will be speaking on the same topic at the famous Redwood Library in Newport, Rhode Island. We're delighted to have him with us tonight. Please join me and welcome to Anderson House, Mr. Robert Geek. Thank you so much, Frank, and thank you to the members of Anderson House, of staff who have given my brother and I such generous hospitality over the last day. I'm delighted to be here at this esteemed organization presenting this for you tonight. So I'm proud to also be here tonight representing the state of Rhode Island with my anchor tie. Uh, that is the symbol of Rhode Island, the symbol of hope, the sheet anchor of salvation, as it was called before it was put on the flag. So of the many contributions that Rhode Island made to the American Revolution, perhaps the most historic was the attempted formation of a regiment of soldiers composed entirely of enslaved men who had enlisted under terms that if met would earn them their freedom. This black regiment, as it came to be known, never materialized entirely as envisioned by Colonel Christopher Green, James Mitchell Varnum, or ultimately General George Washington, who approved the plan. The regiment would ultimately come an amalgamation of enslaved blacks and Indians, as well as free indigenous soldiers, mixed race volunteers and white indentured servants. For those enslaved men of color who did enlist, their very service in the continental line challenged misconceptions of the enslaved man's capabilities, their courage and their loyalty to the American cause. This paper will address these misconceptions and how they were changed during the lifetimes of the men who served and for generations of their descendants. In the winter of 1777, Regiments from New throughout New England were encamped with the American Army at Valley Forge. These included regiments from Connecticut, including the 2nd, 4th, 5th, 8th, and the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd regiments from New Hampshire, 11 regiments from Massachusetts, the most represented state, and Varnum's Brigade, which included the 1st and 2nd Rhode Island regiments, as well as the 4th and 8th Connecticut regiments that were under his command. Hailing from Rhode Island, the state which held the largest slave population per capita in New England at the time of the war, Brigadier General James Mitchell, Mitchell Varnum was accustomed to the wagoneers, teamsters, cooks, and servants who accompanied the armies to its encampments, as well as to the soldiers of color who were also widely interspersed among the regiments 
and generally respected by their fellow soldiers. These early enlistees were almost exclusively free men, with an occasional enslaved person serving for their master or a close relative of the master who had been drafted. Such acceptance, however, from the military brass and political bodies of the early Republic would not come easy. Men of color had been integrated into New England militia since the formation of such companies in the region, and they were included in the adult male populations that were expected to turn out for routine musters and drills for defense of towns and villages. Many individuals of color, including African-Americans, mulattoes, and indigenous men, had signed on at the war's outset, enlisting with those local militias that sprang like crocuses across New England in the spring of 1775. A significant number had taken part in the siege of Boston, the expedition to Quebec, and battles elsewhere in the first year of the war. General George Washington had reportedly been alarmed to see so many armed men of, men of color in the regiments that surrounded Cambridge as he arrived to take command of the Continental Army, and for a time resisted allowing more to enlist. As initial enlistments expired at the close of 1775, General Gates had, as voted by the generals and approved by Washington, issued an order that recruiters for the Continental Army could not enlist any more men of color, whether free or enslaved. Those who had already enlisted were allowed to serve out their terms. The order dismayed those who had fought beside black soldiers in those early engagements. General John Thomas, commander of the troops that had encamped outside of Roxbury, wrote to John Adams that, quote, we have some Negroes, but I look at them in general as equally serviceable with other men for fatigue, and in action, many of them have proven themselves brave. At the same time, Americans were just beginning to read of the service and bravery of African-American volunteers as new newspapers around the colonies reprinted stories of Samuel Lawrence, who roused the citizens of Lexington on horseback as the British approached, and Peter Salem's bravery and marksmanship at Bunker Hill. Towns throughout the countryside recognized the contributions of their black citizens from early in the war. Perhaps of more concern to the Continental officers in Congress were the attempts by the British to raise battalions of black soldiers. Lord Dunmore's proclamation issued in November 1775 offered freedom to any able-bodied enslaved person who could make their way into Virginia and had made the formation of such a regiment possible. And if it were not for the sickness that broke out among those enlistees, it may well have occurred. The widely read Dr. Samuel Hopkins of Newport, Rhode Island, published a dialogue concerning the slavery of Africans in the wake of Dunmore's proclamation, in which he addressed the fear of many New Englanders who owned slaves and worried that arming those slaves would lead to violence unleashed upon them. Now this had the newspapers to blame for that because as they did print stories of heroic actions of black people, they also printed stories of uprisings in the South. And this began to strike fear within those large estate owners of New England, especially those who own plantations, which were run by slave labor. Uh, so this made a major impact upon the decision to Rhode Island to form a black regiment that we'll discuss in just a little bit. So the minister warned in his pamphlet that, quote, the only way pointed out to prevent this threatening evil is to set the blacks at liberty ourselves by some public acts and laws and then give them proper encouragement to labor or to take arms in defense of the American cause as they shall choose, end quote. With the threat of an Ethiopian regiment, as Dunmore liked to call it, being raised for Great Britain's army, the commander in chief became more conciliatory. Writing to Colonel Henry Lee on December 20th, 1775, quote, we must use the Negroes or run the risk of losing the war. Success will depend on which side can arm the Negroes faster, end quote. Still, only men, uh, free men of color, were allowed to enlist. Cognizant that, quote, the free Negroes who have served in this army are very much dissatisfied in being discarded, Washington wrote, I have presumed to depart from the resolution respect them, respecting them, 
and have given license for their being enlisted. If this is disapproved by Congress, I will put a stop to it, end quote. Well, the Continental Congress approved a measure on the 16th of January, 1776, that the free Negroes who have served faithfully in the army at Cambridge may be reinstated, but still no others. The order by Congress, however, had little effect upon those local militias who continued to enlist enslaved men. Even at a moment's notice to protect their shorelines. One such example occurred in Rhode Island just before the great congressional debate that month, as citizens, including men of color, faced off against the demands of the infamous captain, British Captain James Wallace. Since the summer of 1774, Wallace had patrolled the Rhode Island coastline in the HMS Rose. And with sister ships, the HMS Glasgow and HMS Swan routinely raided and plundered coastal communities off the island shore. One such island that had caught Wallace's attention was a six mile long lamb chop shaped Prudence Island seen here. Lying an equal distance uh, of a mile and a half from Warwick Neck to the west and Bristol to the east, the island was long used by farmers to keep their livestock safe from predators. And by 1774, 33 families also called the island home. On August 24th, 1775, Wallace landed 200 men on the island and plundered the farm of John Allen, stealing 20 sheep, 30 turkeys, and bushels of corn, as well as hay. The following November, another raiding party stole clothing and furniture, even a large mahogany desk from a house, and carried it to the ship offshore. When the impudent captain wrote to Governor John Wanton, demanding more goods from the island, militia captain Samuel Pierce head of the second Portsmouth company, decided the time had come to make a stand. He ordered all women and children off the island and all that remained were 32 men under his command, among them 11 enslaved African-Americans, most likely the property of the extensive Allen family. These were taken into the company, given weapons and taught to use them for the coming battle. With their forces soon bolstered by men of the Kentish Guard from Warwick and militias from Bristol and Tiverton, they faced off and fought the invaders on the 13th of January, driving the British back to their vessels before retreating from the island that night. Had the Congress heard of these enslaved men's willingness to fight, would that have altered their opinion? Despite the eagerness of African Americans and indigenous men to enroll, Massachusetts and Connecticut initially attempted to curb the enlistment of individuals of color. An act passed by the Massachusetts Assembly in November 1776 exempted Negroes, mulattoes, and Indians from serving in the Continental Line. While little more was done to expand the policy by Congress, in the states, African Americans continued to be taken into local militia who largely patrolled New England's vast coastline. These militia units were of great importance in the defense of the small villages that had grown along the shores. Militia units within each state and sometimes from neighboring states were often called for three weeks to three months service performing such patrolling and guard duty, but were also embedded at a moment's no notice into larger units with the call to arms and typically sent on the march with three days provision, no matter their destination. As Congress sent out higher quotas for enlistment, the shortage of troops necessitated the state assemblies to ease some of those restrictions. Calls grew louder among citizens and soldiers for Congress to reconsider allowing men of color to enlist. Moreover, by the close of 1776, a pamphlet entitled Liberty Further Extended, written by Lemuel Haynes, a patriot of color enlisted in the Continental Army, had been given wide circulation. Now, Haynes had joined the Granville, Massachusetts militia after becoming free from indenture in 1774. He had joined the men on the march to Roxbury after the skirmish at Lexington and Concord and performed garrison duty at the captured Fort Ticonderoga in 1776. Now, Haynes' words for the first time challenged the founders' meeting of the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and forwarded the phrase as a universal declaration of human rights. 
Liberty is equally as precious to a black man as it is to a white one, Haynes would write, and bondage as equally intolerable as to one as it is to the other. In January 1777, the Massachusetts Assembly eased the restrictions on African Americans and indigenous people enlisting. By June 1st then, the muster roll of Captain Charles Colton's second company of the 3rd Massachusetts Regiment included 11 soldiers of color. In May 1777, a debate in the Connecticut Assembly raised the possibility of recruiting and training a regiment comprised of these patriots of color, but rejected it and passed another act that allowed residents to hire blacks as substitutes for service. Well, this brought an immediate response from the large landowners who held within their property numerous slaves, many of whom desired to enlist. However, as conditions did not yet provide freedom in exchange for service, that issue was later addressed in an October session in 1777 as, quote, an additional inducement for enlistment and likely be able to support themselves at the close of the war. If, if the enslaved persons were able-bodied and likely to be able to support themselves at the close of the war, they, quote, might earn their freedom, the master might secure exemption from the draft and a discharge from future liabilities to which he might, must otherwise have been subjected. That very summer of 1777 brought news of the daring expedition from a band of Rhode Island militia that successfully took Major General Prescott, the British commander of the forces that occupied Newport and a Quidnick Island prisoner. The raid conducted by Lieutenant Colonel William Barton on a farm on the Middletown Portsmouth border where the Major General was inclined to stay was made more sensational in the press by the prominent role of an African-American in the affair who reputedly broke down the door of the bedchamber to reach the British officer. Newspapers and soldiers, journals alike recounted the story. The account in the Pennsylvania Evening Post relates much of the details that were printed elsewhere. The troops under Barton set out from Warwick, Rhode Island the evening of July 9th, 1777, and rode carefully past the British, British flotilla by muffling the oars. As the newspaper recounts, quote, they landed about three quarters of a mile from the house, which they approached cautiously. The Colonel went foremost with a stout, active Negro close behind him, and another at a small distance. The rest followed as to be near, but not seen. After they had entered the house and confronted the landlord, uh, which under penalty of death, uh, he pointed to the general's chamber, which being instantly opened by the Negro's head, the Colonel calling the general by name, told him that he was now a prisoner. Well, the newspapers dubbed the Black Patriot Prince, a name used by many slave owners, but recent research by historian Christian McBurney shows that the black man was almost certainly Jack Sisson, pictured here, a volunteer with Captain Thomas Cole's company of Newport. He would later serve two years as a wagoneer in Captain John S. Dexter's company of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. All of these events conspired to appeal to patriots of color to join the cause of liberty and for those slave owners to manumit those men who did desire to enlist. A few, Washington's further decision to leave the recruitment of blacks to the discretion of regimental commanders created a remarkable fluidity among those soldiers of color that lasted throughout the war. And I'll give you a few examples of this. A few like Pomp Adore enlisted in Captain John Eli's regiment in Connecticut on May 26, 1777, and effectively remained on the muster rolls throughout the war. Samuel Bush of Stamford, Connecticut, enlisted on January 1st, 1777, in Captain Stephen Betts Company of the 2nd Connecticut Regiment, and continued to serve through at least 1779. Many others carried their enlistments through the war in different companies and sometimes in neighboring states. Bristol Baker fought in three separate con Connecticut regiments from 1777 on, ending his military career in Colonel David Humphrey's company of colored troops. Thomas Amos enlisted as a laborer in his native Freetown, Massachusetts early in the war, but later enlisted in Tiverton, Rhode Island, and served in the 1st Rhode Island Regiment after its formation in 1778. James Carpenter 
shows on the early rolls of Varnon's brigade, but later enlisted in McClellan's regiment of Connecticut state troops. And Anthony Flagg served both in regiments in Swansea, Massachusetts and Bristol, Rhode Island. London Bailey is also someone else who was listed as a servant to an officer on service rolls from Dighton, but later enlisted as a soldier in units from Taunton and Eastern Massachusetts. To appreciate the effect which this had, uh, which the Connecticut Act had, uh, may be seen in William C. Nell's original compilation of a list of black participants, which names over 150 men of color in Connecticut who enlisted in the year 1777 alone. Rhode Island was also actively recruiting soldiers of color. Two black men who rode to British occupied Newport in July of 1777 informed the commander that blacks were being taken into militias with the promise of pay and freedom. A good number of these early soldiers of color in the Rhode Island regiments and town militias were enslaved men sent out on subscription by their masters in place of a son or a close relative, much as Connecticut had done. A testimony from a Hessian soldier written on the 23rd of October, 1777, confirms that, quote, the Negro can take the field instead of his master, and therefore no regiment is to be seen in which there are not Negroes in abundance, and among them are able-bodied, strong, and brave fellows. Many of these patriots of color in the New England regiments would converge and be part of the encampment at Valley Forge that December. Varnum's Brigade in 1777, with its two Rhode Island regiments and the 4th and 8th from Connecticut, were stationed that summer in Peekskill, New York, from July on, mostly patrolling along the Croton River, and at times having members dispatched for special expeditions. In August, for instance, the 1st Rhode Island Regiment under Colonel Christopher Green was sent on the march to Fort Montgomery on the Hudson River. A large number of the regiment was on garrison duty at Fort Clinton, by August 7th under command of Colonel Adam Comstock. Later that month, detachments were taken from both Colonel Israel, Israel Angel's 2nd Rhode Island Regiment and from the Connecticut Regiment under Colonel Samuel B. Webb to support an expedition under command of Brigadier General Samuel H. Parsons. The expedition was intended to raid Long Island while a second led by James Mitchell Varnum would march into Westchester County. But with the Americans' loss at the Battle of Brandywine on September 11th, 1777, the British Army were eventually able to march and take the capital of the early Republic. Still, the American Navy and Army controlled the Delaware River south of the city and the Delaware River Valley, which the Americans now concentrated on protecting to thwart efforts by the British to establish a supply line that would allow a prolonged occupation. Varnum's brigade received word to join forces along the Delaware River and began the march to Philadelphia on September 29th. The four battalions numbered then about 1,600 men and took up a rigorous route from dawn to dusk, averaging 20 miles per day until they reached their destination. These included the 1st Rhode Island Regiment under command of Colonel Christopher Green, the 2nd Rhode Island under Colonel Israel Angel, the 4th Regiment of Connecticut Infantry under Colonel John Durkee, and the 8th Regiment of Infantry under Colonel John Chandler. On October 7th, Washington gave orders to Varnum to detach Colonel Christopher Green's regiment of some 250 men to defend Fort Mercer at Red Bank on the Jersey side of the Delaware. He was instructed to coordinate defenses with the Navy and the New Jersey militia if needed to protect Fort Mifflin as well, located on a small island mid-river northwest of Fort Mercer. After inspecting the breastworks on arrival at Red Bank, however, Colonel Green determined that more troops would need, be needed to defend the fort. He sent a dispatch to Washington asking that the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment, under Colonel Angel, be sent to bolster the troops, and waited anxiously until October 18th when the veteran soldiers of that battalion arrived. The troops quickly took steps to reinforce the inner redoubt of the fort closest to the riverbank, moving artillery into position and building breastworks along the outer fortifications protected by brush and timbers. Within only a few days on October 21st, 1,200 Hessian soldiers under Count Dunlop 
had crossed the river from Philadelphia and taken up positions just 10 miles from the port. The following morning, six British warships broke through the river obstructions laid by the New Jersey militia and began shelling Fort Mifflin. The American guns responded, responded vigorously and kept the ships at bay for several hours, sending two of them afire when they ran aground attempting to maneuver upriver. Within minutes, the Augusta with her 64 guns and the frigate Merlin were destroyed. Sorry. Shortly after noon, as Colonel Green had foreseen, the Hessians launched an attack by land on Fort Mercer, marching through the outer fortifications in two columns with little difficulty, only to be shattered by the fire from the well-fortified inner redoubt. As the stunned Hessian troops fell back, the Americans continued the assault with a brisk firing of cannon and musketry so continuous that minutes must have seemed an eternity to those subjects who had been forced to fight on foreign soil. Over 80 of the Hessians were killed, and their leader, Count Dunlop, was wounded and captured during the fight. Now, the victorious defense of Fort Mercer has long been attributed to the leadership of Colonel Christopher Green, his insight into the attack from land, and the strategy that led to victory by letting those Hessians wander through the hastily thrown up outer fortifications and letting their guard down until the first volley had already been fired at them from a close distance. Other historians have differed, particularly William Cooper Nell, the early black historian who quoted an anti-slavery speech in the colored patriots of the American Revolution, during which a Missouri speaker spoke of Rhode Island's example in integrating their mili military. Uh, the speaker said, quote, the gallant defense of Red Bank in which the black regiment bore a part is part proof of their valor. Now, while the black regiment had not actually officially been informed, among the soldiers of color who were there, as best we can discern, were Francis Baptist, John Daniels, Quash Carr, James Carpenter, Prince Lemus, Pomp Davenport, Henry Hazard, and Prosper Gorton, just to name a few of what is believed to have been more than a dozen patriots of color. While they do not bear all the glory for victory, what is perhaps more important is the impression made upon the field officers who would ultimately convince their commander of the worth of adding African Americans to the cause of liberty. Moreover, the assault on Fort Mifflin would continue in the weeks to come after a short lull that lasted into early November. On the night of the 10th, the British began bombarding the fort from land-based artillery positions. And for the next four days and nights, the men there endured a constant barrage while they sheltered behind the stone wall of the fort that lay along the east side of the island. Two floating batteries sent by the British were repulsed on the night of the 14th, but the next morning the Royal Navy sent six 64-gun ships, a 36-gun frigate, one 24-gun ship and a galley into the main channel just southeast of the fort. That flotilla sent a continuous rain of fire and lead from the sea. The bombardment from British land batteries also continued throughout the day, with a total of 39 heavy cannon firing into the port from seven different positions. Well, at dusk on November 15th, Brigadier General Varnum, by then at Fort Mercer, dispatched a note to General Washington on the situation at hand. We have lost a great many men today, he wrote. A great many officers were killed or wounded. My fine company of artillery is almost destroyed. Well, see, we shall be obliged to evacuate this fort this night. While well, the troops marched from the ruins for a rendezvous with Brigadier General Nathaniel Green's regiment at Mount Holly, and then crossed the Delaware to join with the main army at White Marsh. Varnum's men were building huts for the winter encampment by December 7th at Valley Forge. So by the winter of 1777 then, these Patriots of color were hardened veterans, both seasoned to the rigors of a sparse encampment, and what is more, they had proven themselves to be capable soldiers in the field. If they were scarcely noticeable to the field officers at Valley Forge, it was because these soldiers of color had by this time become interwoven into the fabric of the American army and become soldiers as much as the white men they dug trenches beside 
that they stood guard with in the freezing cold and that they slept beside in the cots in the crude cabins of that first winter in Valley Forge. These men included the estimated 15% of the Rhode Island forces that had gathered, as well as a sizable number from Massachusetts and Connecticut regiments. Barnum had taken residence in the home of David Stevens, roughly one and a half miles from Washington's headquarters. The brigade was encamped some 300 yards beyond the house in the ruins of a star redoubt that remained one of the strongest works at Valley Forge at a height that commanded the road and the river for miles. It was there in the low ceilinged great room of the stone house with its massive fireplace that the officers of the Rhode Island regiments and likely a few guests from neighboring states gathered and debated the legitimacy of creating a black regiment to serve in the continental line. It may well be that these officers felt as historian Charles Royster noted that this first winter encampment with the entirety of the Continental Army now in one community was perhaps the last opportunity to enliven once again the eagerness to earn the reputation and respect in military service that would serve them well in their communities back home. Now the Army sought new recruits to add to those veteran soldiers whose temporary surrender of personal freedom had become a source of communal and personal pride. Richard K. Showman, the editor of General Nathaniel Green's papers believes that Colonel Christopher Green was the prime mover in organizing a black regiment for the Continental Line. The field officer had proved his mettle at Fort Mercer and gained the respect and loyalty of the troops under his command, including those of color. Moreover, Green and Varnum had good reason to believe that a regiment could be raised. The Rhode Island census of 1774 shows the state to hold the largest number of blacks per capita of any New England state, broken down by percentages of population. While the average of towns across the entire colony was just 9%, towns like Newport, North Kingston, and South Kingston, the percentages of people of color were much higher, 14%, 12%, and 23% respectively. South Kingston being home to the majority of the plantations of the Narragansett planters. As Rhode Island and other states faced difficulties in fulfilling the new quotas Congress had asked the Army for in the coming year, it's not difficult to imagine how the idea of a regiment of color was resurrected. As a decision was taken among them, Varnum crafted a proposal to General Washington, which he officially dispatched on January 2nd. Sir, the two battalions from the state of Rhode Island being small, and there being a necessity of the states furnishing an additional number to make up their proportion in the Continental Army, the field officers have represented to me the propriety of making one temporary battalion from the two so that one entire corps of officers may repair to Rhode Island in order to receive and repair the recruits for the field. It is imagined that a battalion of Negroes can easily be raised there. Should that measure be adopted, or recruits obtained upon any other principle, the service will be advanced. Varnum laid out the other service needs of the proposed regiment and asked to send Colonel Christopher Green, Lieutenant Colonel Jeremiah Olney, and Major Samuel Ward to the state at once to begin in recruitment of the enslaved men who sought enlistment. Washington approved the measure and on the same day advanced the letter to Rhode Island's Governor Nicholas Cook, adding a short note to accompany the letter upon the means which might be adapted for completing the Rhode Island troops to their full proportion in the Continental Army. Washington wrote, I desire that you will give the officers employed in this business all the assistance in your power. The governor, Nicholas Cook, placed the measure before the General Assembly in the February session. Weathering the opposition from landowners in what was then Kings County, the southern region of the state, which held the largest population of enslaved workers. With Washington's letter expressing his wishes, propelling the assembly to act in his favor, compromise of the plantation owners was reached, if not begrudgingly allowing their enslaved men to enlist. The assembly's act reads in part, quote, it is voted and resolved that every able-bodied Negro, mulatto, and Indian male man-slave in this state may enlist in either of the said two battalions 
to serve during the continuance of the present war with Great Britain, that every slave so enlisting shall be entitled to and receive all the bounties, wages, and encouragements allowed by the Continental Congress to any soldier enlisting into their service. It is further voted and resolved that every slave enlisting shall, upon passing muster before Colonel Christopher Green, be immediately discharged from the service of his master or mistress and be absolutely free as though he had never been encumbered with any kind of servitude or slavery. Such language in the bill, however, would not have been passable without the additional clauses that mollified the plantation masters. Quote, and in any case, slaves shall by sickness or otherwise be rendered unable to maintain himself. He shall not be chargeable to his master or mistress, but shall be supported at the expense of the state. And whereas slaves have been by the laws deemed the property of their owners, and therefore compensation ought to be made for the loss of their service. A commission was established. Some of the men that served on the commission were those who had protested and were part of the planter society. And they would determine the monetary value of each formerly enslaved man. The state would then pay the former owners the value the commission had determined. It was also decided that these patriots of color would only receive half the pay of the enlisted privates in the black regiment. Now, despite these obstacles, recruiting had begun before the actual vote of the assembly with Christopher Green and Major Samuel Ward dispatched to Rhode Island on the 6th of January. We'll go back to that in a minute. Others soon followed to help with the recruitment. Captain Thomas Arnold left Valley Forge on January 8th, and just a day later, Sergeant Jeremiah Greenman of the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment and John Smith of Arnold's company were also dispatched. Brigadier General Nathaniel Green wrote to his brother Christopher of their distant cousin's mission. The soldiers of the two regiments are put into one, and Colonel Green and all his officers are coming home to recruit a Negro regiment. Will they succeed or not? Now, the formation, Rhode Island's decision to form, formulate a black regiment in the continental line also had an effect on legislators and military leaders facing the rising quotas from Congress for recruitment. Just weeks after General Varnum had dispatched recruiters to Rhode Island, the legislature of Massachusetts received a letter from Thomas Kench, then serving with Colonel Kraft's Massachusetts Regiment of Artillery, stationed on Castle Island in Boston Harbor. Looking ahead to the summer campaigns and the need for more troops, Kench wrote on April 3rd, 1778, that, quote, a reinforcement can quick be raised of two or 300 men. Will your honors grant me and give me the command of the party? And what I refer to is Negroes. We have divers of them in our service mixed with white men, but I think it would be more proper to raise a body by themselves than to have them intermixed with white men. And then their ambition would be entirely to outdo the white man in every measure that the fortune of war calls a soldier to endure. While the legislature declined to form a singular regiment as Rhode Island had done, but rewrote more or less the Rhode Island statute that allowed enslavement to enlist into regiments populated by black and white soldiers. The act likely also empowered men of color already serving to demand equal respect from their fellow soldiers and officers. One such incident took place in Warwick, Rhode Island, between two of the militia units from Massachusetts that had been assigned the guard duty off the coastline of Warwick Neck. On March 1st, 1778, Private Noah Robinson of Colonel John Daggett's regiment from Attleboro would record a story in his journal in which a man of color serving in some capacity under Corporal Isaiah Cole entered the encampment of Captain Peleg Pecker, the fourth company of Swansea militia, to complain that the corporal had struck him. Peck's commander, Colonel Thomas Carpenter, ordered the individual under guard. Captain Peck's men refused, or a part thereof, and rescue, rescued him, which caused, quote, a fluster in the regiment. Those who rescued the black man were also arrested, including First Lieutenant Timothy Murray. 
They were confined for two days before the intervention of Major General Jeremy Spencer. On the afternoon of March 4th, all of the prisoners were paraded before the regiment and read general orders from Colonel Ezekiel Cornell, who released the prisoners from their bonds. No further punishment was meted out to the black man or the white soldiers who had come to his defense. Undoubtedly, Colonel Green and Major Ward had much to discuss and plan as they departed Valley Forge that January. Though the war was less than three years long, both men had served what must have seemed a lifetime in service and sacrifice. Both were from well-to-do families. Colonel Christopher Green was descended from the distinguished line of the founder of Warwick, Rhode Island, and a distant cousin of General Nathaniel Green. Samuel Ward Jr. was the grandson of Colonial Governor Richard Ward and fifth son of Governor Samuel Ward, who would later be appointed a Supreme Court Justice. The young Ward had, prior to the war, led the life of a privileged young gentleman, that is to serve the family and community with honor, values that often led to public or military service. Both men enlisted and served in Varnum's Brigade. Both had volunteered with nearly 100 other Rhode Islanders to support General Benedict Arnold's expedition to Quebec, and both had been captured on the night of December 31st, 1775, when the siege of the city failed and spent months in prison before their exchange. On their release, both men were promoted, Green to Lieutenant Colonel, while the former Captain Ward was made a major in the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. Both had fought at Fort Montgomery on the Hudson, and again just months before in the Battle of Red Bank, where they had witnessed firsthand the performance of those men of color among their troops, the impetus of their plan for a black regiment. Recruitment began auspiciously with their arrival at home in Rhode Island. The officers enlisted two of Stephen Champlin's enslaved men in South Kingstown, and in Providence enlisted Cuff Green, the enslaved servant of James Green. Sergeant Jeremiah Greenman would record from Providence on the house of the widow Olney, that's Olney's Tavern for those of us who lived in Providence, uh, that he and Arnold were employing ourselves in recruiting as fast as possible. Indeed, as Greenman might have foreseen, the recruitment did meet with some opposition, some of which took the part of violent confrontation. When Captain Elijah Lewis attempted to recruit from the large gathering of men of color who had gathered in South Kingstown, they were harangued by Hazard Potter, one of the great landowners of the area, who told the would-be enlistees that they would be given the worst duties the army could find and would in effect be worked to death. Other owners of especially valued enslaved workers sought to persuade them to remain on the plantation or farm with promises of eventual emancipation, or they turned out less valued workers to the recruiters for enlistment. By March 1778, Colonel Green had a sufficient number to begin training, and Sergeant Jeremiah Greenman would record the occasion of the regiment's arrival in the coastal town of East Greenwich. On February 27th, on the 27th, he wrote, this morning we paraded our slaves for marching to Greenwich. Training began immediately with daily marching and patrolling along the shoreline between East Greenwich and North Kingstown, Rhode Island. Weeks later, Sergeant Greenman would record that the officers, officers were continuing in Greenwich, exercising our recruits. In the after part of the day, we turned out the black troops after we'd received some orders to pick out of guard at 20 men and a sub. They then marched to Quidneset, where they met a guardhouse out of a dwelling house half a mile from the shore. Now daily marching no doubt increased stamina, but much more training would be needed for those formerly enslaved men among the regiment. As enslaved men, they likely would never have, handed a foul, never have handled a fouling piece, no less a musket. The fear of consequences of placing weapons at the hands of former slaves was again an issue that rose in those years of those black uh, people in, rising up in the South. And so those in New England were also fearful of having them accepting to be in a muster in training days or to serve with the militias or with the Continental Army. But now these soldiers who were recruited needed to learn to load and fire their muskets, not only for skirmishes in the woods where the trees gave them cover, but also in the field. 
Making a stand in the open field meant that troops carried on the battle in a carefully choreographed sequence of rags and bend, firing, kneeling, reloading, and standing to fire again. The common musket, of course, used during the Revolutionary War was initially the brown bess. A British origin, the bess was a muzzle-loading smoothbore musket. And throughout the colonies, gunsmiths repaired or remade models of this musket based upon a 1765 design. By 1777, however, the lighter, more durable Charleville manufactured French musket was the weapon of choice for the Continental Army. It is likely that these were the muskets used to train and to arm the Black Regiment. Though notoriously inaccurate and limited to a range of about 80 yards, the musket was the weapon of choice in the open field of battle. The tactic of massing troops into ranks and firing a low valley was intended to produce, quote, a wall of shot that would hopefully do enough damage to the opposing force to halt their attack or force enemy officers to reconsider and withdraw, end quote. Learning to load, fire, and reload as quickly as possible would have been a considerable part of the training received. Each man had a leather box of prepared cartridges, each a ball of paper or cloth filled with shot and powder. This along with a powder horn or container holding additional gunpowder would be needed and learned to, use, to be used with dexterity and quickness in the field. Furthermore, soldiers needed to learn the code of drum rolls in the field, the tactics and discipline needed in battle, and other disciplines, disciplines were sorely needed for these raw recruits. All of this would seem to be impossible to instill in men just the six months from their introductory march to the orchard below Butts Hill, where they made their stand before the Hessians in the Battle of Rhode Island. Colonel Green and Major Samuel Ward had left Valley Forge before the arrival of Baron von Steuben and his rigorous training of the American soldiers there. Other members of Varnum's brigade, however, had stayed the winter, including those soldiers of color who had served under Green at Red Bank. A detachment of black troops was established at Valley Forge from the two Rhode Island regiments. These soldiers of color, under command of Captain Thomas Arnold, had participated with soldiers, other soldiers in von Steuben's training and would play a significant role in several battles to come. The muster roll of Arnold's detachment on March 16, 1778, lists 52 privates. So Arnold's detachment, along with the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment, would distinguish themselves with bravery at the Battle of Monmouth, New Jersey, suffering the loss of Lieutenant Nathan Weeks, who was killed in battle, while Captain Arnold was wounded in the leg and Major Simeon Thayer suffered a shrapnel wound to the eye from a passing cannonball. As Captain Arnold's injuries would take several weeks of rest and recovery, the detachment of soldiers of color was placed under command of Captain Jonathan Wallen. In June of 1778, the 1st Rhode Island Regiment would be called to join John, General John Sullivan's gathering army perched in Portsmouth to wrest Aquidneck Island and Newport from the British. The remainder of the Black Regiment, now under Wallen's command, would march with Colonel Israel Angel's resident on July 22nd, 70, 1778, and head for a rendezvous with the recruits from Rhode Island. On their arrival in early August, the soldiers of color were detached from Barnum, Barnum's brigade and integrated into the four companies that made up of the recruits of the 1st Rhode Island Regiment, completing the battalion with 181 privates fit for duty. The Rhode Island campaign in the summer of 1778 was the second attempt by the Continental Army to wrest Aquidneck Island, known as Rhode Island, from the British and free the shipping lanes between New England's coastal communities, as well as recover some of the revenue lost from the commerce of the trade in goods and slaves that had made Rhode Island a wealthy colony before the war. As with the first attempt, American goods, ammunition, and men were slow to gather. Continental troops were engaged in other campaigns throughout June, and it was not until well into July that many, including Varnum's brigade, reached Rhode Island. Still, the Americans had been bolstered by the recent alliance with the French, and the hopes of troops must have soared with the sight of the French fleet on the horizon on the morning of July 25th. 
In the ensuing days, the French fleet bombarded British fortifications, causing the enemy to withdraw and abandon works at Butts Hill, the northernmost rise that overlooked the long and lush valley of Aquidneck Island. The view framed by the larger Turkey Hill, roughly a mile southwest, and the elongated profile of Quaker Hill to the southeast. General John Sullivan took advantage of the drawback and sent a contingent of American troops under Varnum in boats from Howland Ferry across the Sakonet River to take the abandoned redoubt. They had scarcely arrived and taken the hill on August 9th when the sails of the British fleet appeared on the distant waterline. For the next two days, the most powerful naval fleets in the world were to exchange fire in Narragansett Bay. On August 11th, a fierce gale close to hurricane strength lashed at the ships and dispersed the two fleets. It soaked the troops waiting for the land campaign to be undertaken and ruined much of the goods and ammunition that had been saved and stored. By August 13th, the heavily damaged French flagship Languedoc was attacked by the British warship Renown, inflicting heavy casualties and killing 60 French sailors. Another attack on the crippled ship Caesar by the British ship Isis left another 60 sailors dead. On Aquidneck Island, Sullivan had moved forces further south where they encountered a formidable line of defense that stretched from Green End to Tonomy Hill to Coddington Cove. The two entrenched forces had exchanged cannon fire for a week before the French fleet left the bay for repairs in Boston. While the move by the French stunned and angered the Americans and the fragile alliance was nearly broken. To complicate matters for Sullivan, General Nathaniel Green reported that the following day that nearly half of the troops mustered weeks ago from the campaign had left the scene, leaving 8,174 men to engage the British and Hessian forces controlling the island. Still, Sullivan sent out an optimistic general port report on August 24th, expressing the hope that the American forces would be able to take the, by their own means that which our allies refused to assist in obtaining. When the British troops were reinforced, Sullivan had again to change course and decided to abandon the siege of Newport and evacuate the island. So with the change in Sullivan's tactics, the Rhode Island Regiment were called to play a crucial role in the removal from Aquidneck Island. On the evening of the 24th, the troops and artillery were withdrawn from the siege lines established just two weeks before and formed a new line of defense two miles long, extending from a small rise that held an abandoned British redoubt on the western side of the island to the eastern side, just beyond a crossroad. General Nathaniel Green was placed in charge of protecting the West Road and the redoubt. The 1st Rhode Island Regiment, placed for the battle under command of Major Samuel Ward Jr. was assigned to help protect the American line near the abandoned redoubt, being placed in a nearby orchard. They would be supported by the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment under Colonel Israel Angel and Colonel Henry Jackson's additional Continental Regiment. By 8.30 on the mo morning of the 29th, the bulk of Turkey Hill, just a mile distance, was overtaken by a large force of Hessians and art artillery who then moved on toward the redoubt. On both sides of the island, the British drove Americans back toward the entrenched position in Portsmouth. Hessians attacked Green's command, the American right flank where the Black or First Rhode Island Regiment was posted. And this was a key posting for if the, if the British or the Hessians could overrun the flank and press in on the sides and rear of the American line, they would cut off their retreat from the island. On the first encounter, the troops of the First Rhode Island fell back, seeing the flood of Hessians coming toward the redoubt, Varnum and Green quickly ordered the two veteran regiments to support the outnumbered troops. Some 800 Hessians were coming towards those 181 men. So Colonel Israel Angel recalled that, quote, I was ordered with my regiment to a redoubt on a small hill, which the enemy was trying for. And it was with difficulty that we got there before them, end quote. Once reinforced, the Americans put up an obstinate resistance as the Hessians advanced toward the hill, finding, quote, bodies of troops behind the works 
and then at its sides, chiefly wild looking men in their shirt sleeves, and among them, many Negroes, end quote. After taking heavy casualties, the Hessians fell back to take reinforcements. Watching the enemy regroup before Turkey Hill, Green ordered the remainder of Varnum's brigade into the fray and other reinforcements from Cornell and Lovell's brigades to flank the redoubt. And twice more, the Hessians tried to overrun Green's troops, but failed. The third time, Sullivan would recall, quote, the enemy attacked with greater numbers. Aid was sent forward. There was a short conflict for an hour. Cannon fired on both sides from the hills and the enemy fled to Turkey Hill, leaving his dead and wounded, end quote. After fighting since early morning, the battle was finally finished by four in the afternoon. Green and other officers attempted to persuade Sullivan to launch an attack on the enemy positions that same afternoon, but assessing that some 5,000 British forces had deployed on the hills, the general deferred. And through the night of August 29th, the two sides exchanged long range artillery fire. We soon put the enemy to rout, Greenwood report, adding that, quote, I had the pleasure of seeing them run in worse disorder than they did at the Battle of Monmouth, end quote. So the regiment would receive recognition for its bravery and resolve in action during the Battle of Rhode Island, which took place in the area which surrounds the site of the present monument to the Black Regiment in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. General Nathaniel Green came to believe in the success of a black regiment and during his command of the Southern campaign would strive to convince the South Carolina and Georgia assemblies to raise regiments of enslaved men for the Continental Army. Such legislation cannot fail, Green wrote to Governor John Martin of Georgia, if adopted to fix their liberties upon a secure and cert certain footing, that is to set them free. The governor responded that a body of blacks, I am sure, would answer every purpose intended, but he knew that his constituents would never consent to arming manumitted slaves. It will never go down with the people here, he bluntly informed the general. The 1st Rhode Island Regiment would continue to, in service and sacrifice during the next few years of the war. In January of 1781, the regiment was merged with the 2nd Rhode Island Regiment. The, the, uh, I should say that the, um, that the men of color in the regiment by that time were down to 65 men by 1780 due to illness and uh, sometimes to desertion as well. So the Rhode Island Regiment was then known as the Rhode Island Regiment for the remainder of the war. Uh, and Washington had become by this time largely convinced that integrating black soldiers into experienced white regiments was preferable than segregating his army, though some independent units of black troops were formed in the last years of the war. The Rhode Island Regiment's greatest loss came in May 1781 while stationed along the Croton River, a place that had become perhaps too familiar, which allowed the Rhode Island encampment to be taken by surprise at dawn on the morning of the 13th of May by Colonel James Delancey's Loyalist Light Horse Infantry. More than a dozen of the regiment were killed, including their commanding officers, Colonel Christopher Green and Major Ebenezer Flagg. The majority of the dead soldiers were black men. Some 22 others were taken prisoner that morning. The regiment would recover and play an important battle role in the Battle of Yorktown. At the siege's beginnings, it was patriots of color from the Rhode Island Regiment who were digging trenches under fire for the stationing of the large French cannons that were given to the Continental Ar Artillery. Their young commander, Stephen Olney, would lead the successful charge on Redoubt No. 10, one of the last defenses of the shattered British line, taken on October 14, 1781. But another heavy loss would occur that fall and winter. During a tedious 21-day passage on the Chesapeake, smallpox broke out among the Rhode Island troops. And between November 1781 and March of 1782, some 45 survivors of the attack at Pines Bridge and the Battle of Yorktown would succumb to this disease in the Army's hospital in Philadelphia. It's said that a few each day were buried in a potter's field of the city common. 
And to this date, there is still no monument to the Black Regiment on the Common in Philadelphia, and perhaps it's something we would consider doing. Every New England town has its stories of its patriots of color. Those returning veterans were often lauded in local newspapers after the war and became a kind of living memory of the revolution by appearing in parades and memorial events dressed in their old uniforms. Their stories would become part of the local histories written over generations and thus further interwoven into the full story of the American Revolution. J. Hammond Trumbull, the Secretary of State in Connecticut during the Civil War, wrote that among his many acquaintances, quote, almost every family has a tradition of the good and faithful service of a black servant or slave who was killed in battle or served through the war, came home to tell stories of hard fighting and draw his pension. For many of the former enslaved men who returned to their homes, such as they were, life was largely occupied with the hand-to-mouth existence forced upon these veterans by the harsh realities they had briefly left behind in service. In my book, From Slaves to Soldiers, I highlight the fact that in death, many of these patriots of color receive praise in their obituaries, acknowledging their pride in having served as a soldier of the revolution. While they lived, many faced having to return as laborers to the great estates that had once held them as enslaved men. As these estates were now largely in decline, they received food, clothing, shoes, and on infrequent occasions, money for their work. Often these were now short-term tasks, such as building a wall, removing trunks from a field that needed to be cleared, building roads, or seasonal work for planting and harvesting. To provide for their families, such men often had to work a variety of jobs at several farms each week. Many of these stories are told in the pension applications that are now available online through Ancestry.com and Fold3.com, but they reveal other stories as well of those who faced obstacles to remain receiving the small pension promised to the men by Congress. But despite these difficulties after the war, the legacy of service and sacrifice that these Rhode Islanders and other patriots of color from New England brought honor to their brothers who remained shackled to a life of labor. They lifted up the stature of their people in those who thought their minds already enlightened and fired the first salvo in demanding that the nation for which they fought include people of color with those citizens whose rights included liberty, justice, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you very much. Be happy to take any questions or comments. Yes, sir. It's good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm senior by commander of the American Legion and District of Columbia. Uh, wonder what was the higher rank on the regiment? Uh, I'm sorry, I can I didn't hear you. The highest rank on the black regiment. The highest number? Yeah, one hundred eight. Highest one. rank, rank, rank. Uh, sergeants or they can make lieutenants. Would they ever get officers black? There were there were two who were actually promoted, but then quickly demoted uh, when some of their actions caused them to be disciplined. Uh, but the ma majority, uh, the vast majority, were just privates. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, could you could you go back to that uh, uh, Jean Baptiste painting of uh, Yorktown? Mm -hmm. Sure. And I was wondering if you could explain that uniform. That uniform was not given to the first Rhode Island, members of the first Rhode Island regiment until December of 1780. So you will see, as you saw in Don Trajani's painting, where they're dressed in that uniform, they did not have that uniform at the time. That, that uh, the, the second uh, uh, artist who, you spoke about he was born in 1949, wasn't he? I mean, he's a contemporary artist. He is a contemporary artist, yes. So is this the only uh, illustration from that period? Um, there are others, uh, but I, this is the only one that I'm aware of from that period, yes. Because to me, I mean, they were also 
French troops there at the Battle of Yorktown. That's right. And many of them were from Sun, uh, Sun, from Haiti, what's now called Haiti. Uh, so what evidence is there that this is actually a soldier from Rhode Island and not from uh, Haiti who, who wore um, more, I mean, I think they wore like more stylish uniforms like that. Uh, this is the uniform of the first Rhode Island regiment. It's, it's, it was a linen frock coat. I, I actually am a member of the, um, of the Rhode Island Regiment reenactors. And so we wear that linen frock coat, the pants, and uh, we don't have the plumed hats. We don't have that, but we, but we do have the other uniform. And because that is- Even the anchor, uniform. which is a symbol of Rhode Island- That's right. Wasn't used or adopted by Rhode Island until after that battle. It was- uh, we have a we have one instance of the hat that is at the James Mitchell Varnum Museum in East Greenwich, Rhode Island, um, and that is the only that is the only example that I know of in existence. And and that that uh, relic was it from this period or a reproduction from later on? No, it was from it's an it's an authentic hat. Yes, and it was worn by only this group of uh, African American troops or. Was it worn by other soldiers from Rhode Island? This particular this particular headgear was only worn by the Rhode Island Regiment. There are similar headgears uh, that had a plate on the top and uh, did also have uh, an anchor on it, but those were for the Continental lines, and that was an earlier hat. That's uh, but this was the hat that was made for the First Rhode Island Regiment, and it says uh, in red letters. It has RIR embroidered on it for Rhode Island Regiment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, were there any, is there any research about um, any soldiers of color who may have participated in Green's Southern Campaign in other units? Do we have any accounts of their being part of that at all? No, to my, to my knowledge, the first Rhode Island Regiment was the only one that had after the after the formation of the first Rhode Island regiment, uh, all of the soldiers of color were put into that regiment. Okay. So, all right. Now that's not to say that Green and others did not have blacks among the troops. There were many, many blacks who served in some capacity or another. There were also blacks who served in the militias and were called up to be embedded into troops uh, that happened throughout the war as well. If you can bring back the flag of the regiment, two questions about the stars. It was the last slide. Yeah. I've never seen that arrangement of 13 stars before. Did they represent the colonies? If not, what? And what, what became of that design? Yes, well, I'm glad that you asked that question because this flag is now in... Uh, the State House of Rhode Island, but it is under protection because it is in is in very uh, dilapidated shape. Um, it is the flag of the First Rhode Island Regiment. Um, that anchor and the word hope, which is also on the Rhode Island flag, uh, that came about by the scripture that said uh, that uh, the sheet anchor is the hope of our salvation. The sheet anchor being the heaviest anchor, the one that will not let your ship founder into the uh, into the shoreline. Uh, but yes, that is the, the 13 stars to represent the different colonies and the anchor to represent Rhode Island. And this is a uh, issue that the Varnum Museum in East Greenwich would very, very much like to restore the relic that we have at the State House. Um, for whatever reason, that has not uh, been approved yet. Uh, so if anyone here has any influence in Rhode Island, I would hope that you would uh, call your senator, call, call someone to ask and uh, support this effort by the Varnum Museum to uh, restore the flag of the Rhode Island Regiment, a very important project. And uh, as the curator there and the president now of the Varnum Museum, uh, Patrick Donovan has uh, has arranged that it would not cost the state any money. It just needs approval. And we know how difficult it is just to get approval sometimes. So we'll be working on that in the next uh, couple of days. I hope to call on Senator Whitehouse tomorrow. Yes. 
What's that, please? I'm sorry. How, what is the size of that? Project? Well, I, I carried a replica of one in my last role at the governor's inauguration, and uh, it had to be about 30 feet long. It's a heavy flag, a heavy flag, yes. Silk flag, yeah. Any other questions? We do have some Zoom questions, okay. if you don't mind. Um, one question, we'll take it back to the beginning of the, of the war to 76. Um, Colonel John Glover uh, and his men from Marblehead, Massachusetts, uh, he was known to have um, several soldiers of color, some indigenous uh, yes. soldiers. Did he have any initial influence on Washington? I would think that his uh, the the performance of his troops, especially at uh, Princeton and Trenton, would would have given Washington pause to to not include patriots of color in the army because, as as we see in that famous painting, there were people of color present in Glover's brigade, and uh, they played a very important role in in uh, doing the. Uh, shepherding the troops across across the Delaware and also in Rhode Island. He was brought into Rhode Island to help with the Rhode Island, the Battle of Rhode Island as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we, in, uh, we'll fast forward a little bit to Newport when um, you talk about the Hessians and, and their impressions of, uh, you know, at Fort Mercer and, and other engagements, uh, did they, did, did the first Rhode Island, did the, the colored soldiers of first Rhode Island have the same influence on, say, the French that were in Rhode Island later on in the war? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think that they uh, they made such an impression, you know, and and there's been a a bit of a debate about their role in the Battle of Rhode Island. But uh, Sullivan clearly thought that all of the troops had performed very well, including the Black Regiment. Yeah, so I think they were well received, and from all the evidence that I have seen, the soldiers who fought with them uh, were respected them very much. And um, we have a question about the camp followers. Uh, were there women of color? Were there children of color with the army as well? I'm not sure about children, but absolutely there were women of color, along sometimes with their husbands, who were camp cleaners, who were workers in the encampments, and uh, they would have been familiar to uh, everyone in New England because they would have been in every regiment, every militia unit, and then gone into the continental units as they came into the battles. And just to wrap, uh, kind of bring it all home here, you spoke about um, a lot of different interpretive um, uh, preser and other preservation initiatives that are going on in Rhode Island. It was. Uh, in the introductions uh, by Frank and Andy, uh, can you can you elaborate more on some of the the interpretive efforts that surround the first Rhode Island, uh, the Battle of Rhode Island, mm -hmm. uh, in your homeland, so to speak? <laughs> so before, so uh, besides the effort by uh, the Varnum Museum to restore the regimental flag, there has also been an important group made up of uh, of people who are in Portsmouth who are restoring Butts Hill and also attempting to make that area more accessible to Rhode Islanders. The monument that you see, uh, it's, it's on there. The monument you see there is in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, but it's very, very difficult to get through. It's at uh, literally an intersection between two major roads and you have to cross one and do a roundabout to go into the area of the monument. Um, so those people in Portsmouth of the Battle of Rhode Island um, project are now giving tours to give people an orientation of the battle. And uh, they're also hoping to uh, install a visitor center, which would enable more parking for people coming to visit the monument and also give them uh, much more information uh, although there is a great deal of information about the monument itself once you get there and walk around it. Um, so it, it's very it's very important to keep this story alive. It's very important to maintain these monuments and make them accessible for people. More and more, I'm, I'm one of those people that, I, as, as you stated, I've written 14 books. 
uh, working on another one now called the Battle Off the Field. But more and more in my role uh, as president of Smith's Castle and putting together educational programs there, I came to see that thinking outside the book and presenting outside the book is so important to the majority of the public. Uh, it's how they get their history, you know? So we need to keep doing that. We need to improve it and we need to find the resources and the support to have these projects undertaken and completed um, as, as soon as we can. So thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. Just to follow on your question, um, is are any people working on things for the America 250 Committee as part of the celebrations for the sesquicentennial? Are they working on anything for the... the we, do, we do have a commemoration each year on the day of the battle, August 29th. And yes, I believe that the uh, Battle of Rhode Island, um, the project is going to is going to make sure that that happens much more than it does now than once a year. Yes. Well, I think that is a uh, good place to stop. Uh, wise words, wise words of wisdom there. And uh, we look forward to future projects coming down the pike here. So, Bob, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to come down and speak for us tonight. And thank everybody in attendance for coming out. It's kind of dreary outside, so braving the weather to come here. And for all of you uh, tuning in with us on Zoom, we appreciate uh, your continued support of our mission. Uh, please look forward to seeing this uh, recording of this up on our YouTube channel. And please don't forget to subscribe. And uh, we're, you can find a slew of other our, of our uh, recent programs. Um, so thank you again, and uh, get home safe, everyone. We'll see you thank soon. Thank you, Andrew.